Last one for this week, we're going to put together the concept of thermal equilibrium with phase changes because this question involves an ice cube as well as water. Because as you change phase, some of that thermal energy going out of one substance is used to change the phase and not the temperature of that other substance. So dealing with these, it becomes a little more qualitative. You can't just use the same equation. You have to first of all ask the question. You have to kind of see who wins. When you combine a piece of ice that is at minus 30 degrees Celsius and some water at 35 degrees Celsius, right? You want to know by the end of everything, are we going to have a bucket of water or a big block of ice? Zero degrees here being the critical temperature because that is the melting point of water. Now, in this case, based on the various masses, you might have a fairly good guess. But when you don't have that, it really becomes working out some of these terms to see which one is bigger than the other. And here's how we do that. So to see how much the ice and the water, how far, quote unquote, they are away from this zero degrees point, let's figure that out. So for ice to go from negative 30 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, the specific heat for ice, it's easy to look up. No phase change here, so specific heat. Minusing a negative, positive as you expect, because you have to add in heat to raise the temperature. And conversely, to change 35 degrees water into zero degrees water, in this case, you do get a negative because that is heat loss in the water. Clearly, there's a lot more energy in the water to make up to raise for the ice. And so now we know that it's the ice that's going to come towards the zero degrees. But then here comes another question. Is what's in the water enough heat to also melt all the ice? So that's where we deal with the phase change. And it takes this much energy to convert all the zero degrees ice into zero degrees water. So you can see that this amount is able to supply both this and that. Now that we have those numbers figured out, we'll use some of them again so it's not all wasted work. Because it takes that much more energy to cool the water down to zero degrees, this helps conclude that my final temperature is going to be above zero, so we're just going to have some amount of water at the final temperature. So the transformation each of these substances goes through. For the ice, it's a little more complicated. You got to heat it up to zero degrees, change out the ice to water, and then raise it to some final temperature. But of course, the heat here and the heat here, we already have. For the water, that's initially at 35 degrees Celsius, it just simply becomes water at some final temperature. And so out of both of these, we know that the total heat transfer, because the system is isolated, adds up to zero. So for the ice, you have the part that raises it to zero plus the heat associated with melting plus, and now this here, because the ice have completely changed in the water, we're not going to use the specific heat for the ice. This is water we're talking about. All equals zero. So the only unknown we have here is the final temperature. Some amount of algebra later. So the final temperature ends up being 20.6 degrees Celsius. So in considering these kind of questions, first of all, identify which boundary you might be talking about and evaluate which substance there's enough energy to completely cross the boundary. So in this case, the ice went from a negative 30 degrees piece of ice to a zero degrees piece of ice, all melting to zero degrees water, and then warming up to 20.6 degrees Celsius. So each of those steps involves the amount of heat you can calculate. And depending if it's ice or water, you have to use the appropriate specific heat.